Greetings, Earth and Space Explorers. Welcome to Doc Waller's Earth and Space Report for Friday, June 25, 2021. I'm your host, Bill Waller, an astronomer, science educator, and communicator coming to you on a rain-swept evening in Rockport, Massachusetts. These Earth and Space Reports are intended to engage and inform people like you who are curious about Earth as a planet, who care about our life-sustaining environment, and who wonder about the greater cosmos, including our place in space and moment in time. Video recordings of these reports are archived on the Earth and Space Reports YouTube channel. Today, we are joined by members of the Rockport Cultural Council, Gloucester Area Astronomy Club, and other curious folk. Thank you for coming. This evening, I will be talking about our cosmic origins, a wide-ranging topic involving both the Earth and space sciences. Just consider the origins of basic elements, such as the gold in my wedding band, the silver in my friendship band, or simple molecules such as the water in my glass, Ta-da! or minerals such as the blue quartz found here on Cape Ann, beautiful blue quartz, or composite rocks such as the granite that characterizes most of Cape Ann where I live, or plant life such as the ash tree that got cut down to make this log or squishy animal life, such as you and me. There's a lot to, there is a lot to cover, so let's get to it. Okay, so as I noted, uh, I'm talking about uh, our cosmic origins and um, that can involve all kinds of origins. And there's a timeline uh, for these origins. I have to get some people in, admit all, okay. All right. Okay. And uh, here there's eight stages from the particulate to the cultural and our future. Uh, but I'll probably get as far as uh, the biological uh, in exploring our cosmic origins. Okay. Go back. There you go. All right. Um, so a, a question all of us can ask is how did our earthly home come into being? Now, not all of you live where I live, uh, but I have an example, which I'm gonna focus on. You will have your own examples, uh, which uh, are sh shared in many ways, especially as you go back in time. Uh, but I live on Cape Ann, which is a part of Massachusetts. Some of you might recognize Boston and Cape Cod, the other Cape. Uh, the, I am a chauvinist for Cape Ann. And it's surrounded on three sides by ocean, which is a very uh, important aspect of our planet. And uh, a big question is how did this rock, uh, which is separated from the mainland by two road bridges, for cars and one railroad bridge. How did this rock uh, get made? Okay. So the answer uh, was provided by Carl Sagan rather nicely uh, saying that if you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. And uh, so we're gonna take that approach uh, to discuss how all this got made, including myself, uh, who lives right around here where my arrow is shown. <laughs> okay. So you have to go back to the first light, uh, the hot Big Bang, approximately 14 billion years ago. Uh, some people say 13.7 billion years ago. Other people say 13.8 billion years ago. And um, that's when space, our space and time began. And it was shortly followed by an epoch of inflation in the first 10 to the minus 32 seconds when the universe expanded, it doubled in size uh, approximately 60 times in less than 10 to the minus 32 seconds. And uh, that flattened out the universe, uh, got rid of any curvature it might've had uh, and solved other problems in cosmology. And what you have is basically a bitch's brew of particles, including um, electrons, protons, neutrons, 
and photons. Those are the particles of light. Now, uh, there was a period over about three minutes or so when the protons and the neutrons could, could combine to produce uh, nuclei of helium. So that would involve two protons and two neutrons. It had to occur within about five minutes or so because the neutron tends to decay back into its constituent uh, protons and electrons and neutrinos. So we know that this nucleosynthesis, this basic nucleosynthesis probably happened in the first three minutes or so. Another 380,000 years would have to pass before the universe expanded enough to cool enough and so enable the electrons to recombine back onto uh, these nuclei, either the hydrogen nuclei or the helium nuclei. And that was when you first had uh, neutral atoms as opposed to free charges. And that enabled the light to escape. No longer uh, did the uh, light get ha harassed by pesky charges and it could stream out and uh, be seen as the cosmic microwave background. So that's really the first light that we see, this epic, which I'll show later on. Then there's this dark age, which we know very little about. We, our instruments aren't powerful enough yet, but uh, they're getting there. Uh, and that's when uh, there was more cooling and congealing and maybe the first galaxies. We now think that the very first stars and galaxies formed sometime around 300 million years after the hot big bang. Uh, in fact, there's some a, a recent galaxy detection that uh, confirms this. Uh, these galaxies were not the galaxies uh, that we know today. Uh, they were uh, little blobs um, which merged and, to form the giant galaxies that characterizes uh, the universe today. Okay, so it's a long, strange trip, a tall tale. But uh, the, uh, the observational cosmologists and the theoretical cosmologists do seem to be converging on this scenario. So here is uh, the first evidence that we have, the first hints of structure uh, in the cosmic microwave background. This is an all sky picture of the cosmic microwave background. This is after they had to remove the foreground <laughs> of radio emission from the Milky Way itself. Uh, and so this is what's uh, left over after they've gotten rid of uh, that and other foregrounds. And uh, it's incredibly smooth, actually. Uh, they've enhanced the contrast, but it would be the equivalent uh, smoothness as a well-groomed ice skating rink, the surface of a well-groomed ice skating rink. This is, so there's the, the, the contrast, uh, the over densities and the under densities are, are, are basically on one part in 100,000 or so. And the spacing is characteristic of about a, a one degree spacing, which is consistent with a universe which doesn't have curvature. Okay, so if, if you had an enormous uh, house uh, bigger than a galaxy cluster, it would still look like a cubic house. It wouldn't look like it was curved. And that's because the space it's in is not curved either. Um, so uh, they've learned a lot about uh, the universe uh, just based on the characteristics of this cosmic microwave background. Come on. There we go. Okay. Uh, so what was in the universe back then? Well, it was different. It consisted mostly of uh, dark matter, which we don't know much about. Uh, we know that it's probably not ordinary stuff, ordinary dark matter like dead stars or planets. Um, it, it's probably some strange particles, but that's about all we know. Um, and then of course the universe was ablaze with photons of light and it did have ordinary matter in the form of atoms and a, a good amount of neutrinos, which is, is a form of dark matter. Uh, it's kind of hot dark matter. And um, so that's basically uh, what the, the universe was made of back then. Uh, it's different now. You still have a lot of dark matter uh, along with the ordinary atoms that we're more familiar with, but now there's all this dark energy, 72% dark energy, which we know even less about than 
we know about the dark matter. Uh, we're fairly persuaded uh, in favor of the existence of this dark matter because there must be something that is propelling the universe of galaxies to be expanding ever faster. Uh, so that's one reason for the dark energy. Also, uh, another reason for the dark energy is the flatness of the universe. As, as I said, it doesn't seem to have any strange curvature and something must be flattening the universe uh, in addition to all the matter energy that we can detect. So uh, it's strange no matter when you look. <laughs> If we look deeply with our uh, most sensitive optical telescopes, such as the Hubble Space Telescope, with the longest exposures to make the Hubble Ultra Deep Field and other deep fields, they see galaxies upon galaxies. Uh, some of these are nearby and they look like giant galaxies, similar to the Milky Way galaxy. But then there are a lot of little, little lumps and bumps that can be seen in these uh, green squares and if they're, they, they're blown up here and you, you basically see you know little lumps little bumps uh, what I am fond of saying uh, little red turds at the edge of infinity and um, they don't look like today's galaxies we are biased towards their uh, regions of active star formation but even so they do seem to be much smaller than uh, the ones that were the galaxies that we're familiar with today. Uh, so how do you get the bigger galaxies? Well, there's a lot of merging. The universe was a lot more crowded back then. And uh, so the likelihood of galaxy or subgalactic mergers into bigger galaxies was much greater. And if there was any residual rotation to the merger process, uh, you would end up getting a, 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 a net rotation uh, to the system. And if that condition exists, you will end up getting a preferential collapse towards the midplane, uh, basically perpendicular to the axis of rotation. And that's how we think uh, galaxies like our own galaxy uh, are made. You end up getting a, a, a maybe a bulge dominated system, but with a flattened disk in ordered rotation. How long it takes, we're not sure uh, how long this, uh, this process takes, but uh, we keep finding galaxies at, at high redshifts implying great look back times corresponding to only 300 million years after the hot big bang, uh, the universe was able to get itself this together, this much together. So, um, our own Milky Way looks something like this. This is an artist's uh, depiction of our Milky Way galaxy. In this uh, depiction, uh, we have a central bulge made up of uh, yellowish stars like the sun. So they're essentially uh, relatively low mass um, and probably relatively old. There's a, a central bar of these sorts of stars as well. And then going off of the bar, there's these two spiral arms. There's two major spiral arms. Uh, the court is out as to whether there's two spiral arms or four spiral arms, but uh, we're pretty convinced that there are at least two spiral arms. And you might notice that the spiral arms contain blue stars, a bluish light, and uh, that's because uh, there is a, a skim coat of uh, blue, hot, relatively young stars uh, because they burn, these hot blue stars uh, burn brightly and they don't last as long. And so if you see them, uh, they must have been recently made. In addition, there are these little red zones and those indicate the places where the most recent star formation has been taking place uh, because uh, there's still gas to respond to the newborn young hot stars. Looking edge on uh, our galaxy, you can sort of see what our galaxy looks like uh, just by looking at it uh, edge on. But this is an example, another example of a galaxy, NGC 891. And it shows that the disk is pretty thin. 
Uh, it has uh, blue stars in there, but also an awful lot of obscuring dust. And this, this dust is basically tracing clouds of gas and dust. Uh, and it's the dust that's obscuring the light from behind. And this is important because this is where star formation is occurring today. If I was a betting man, and I guess I am, I play poker, uh, I would say that this galaxy, Messier 109, comes closest to what our Milky Way galaxy looks like. This is an actual picture. And it has the, the, the central bulge, uh, a bar of yellowish stars, the, the spiral arms hang off of the bar, uh, they're bluish along with the, uh, the, the gaseous regions, um, which I, I would regard as the crucibles of creation, uh, still, uh, still occurring here in this uh, galaxy. So I've made a big deal about galaxies. Uh, you, ha you had to make them first. And, uh, but the question is, what do galaxies have to do with the origin and evolution of Earth, my Cape Ann home, and your homes. And um, I've said this before, I'll say it again, that just as it takes a village to raise a child, so too it takes a galaxy to bring forth stars in the galaxies and the chemical complexity uh, that is necessary, necessary to make rocky planets and life on these worlds. And uh, so going back to what you can see, uh, here is a view of, from a desert mountain in Chile, the Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory. And you can see first this object, it's a naked eye object. Uh, you can see in a dark sky like this. Uh, this is the Large Magellanic Cloud. It's a companion galaxy to our Milky Way galaxy. It's about a 10th the size of our Milky Way galaxy. And here's the Small Magellanic Cloud, another companion galaxy. Um, in the thrall of our galaxy. This has been said to look like a pork chop. I don't know, maybe so. Our Milky Way galaxy or a part of it is, is seen here. Uh, and there's some prominent members here. I think the brighter object here is um, Alpha Centauri system. It's the closest stellar system to us, only four light years away or 4.4 light years away. There's Beta Centauri, which is farther away. And then there's this beautiful kite-like uh, asterism of stars, uh, which is called the Southern Cross or Crux. And uh, this can be, be seen in the flags of Brazil, New Zealand, uh, Australia, uh, very popular uh, pattern in the sky. Uh, and then on top of it or above it is the coal sack, which is a uh, relatively nearby example of a gas cloud whose associated dust is obscuring light from behind. So there's also more evidence of obscuring dust here. And we can see that all along the Milky Way. As, as is evident with this all sky view uh, by Axel Mellinger, how did he put it together? Well, he took pictures from the Northern hemisphere and he took pictures from the Southern hemisphere as the Magellanic clouds and he stitched them together uh, to make this wonderful mosaic, all sky mosaic. And you can see there's a lot going on. Uh, and uh, there, there is what seems to be a direction, a favored direction uh, towards Sagittarius. And that is the direction of our bulge, a galactic bulge. And there's uh, regions of uh, redness. And those are where these crucibles of creation or galactic ecosystems are uh, very active. But I'm going to focus on this one particular region here. This is the Orion star forming region seen in the visible. Uh, and uh, I'm going to now uh, focus in on that. Most of you are familiar with Orion as a constellation. Uh, it's available to everybody on the planet uh, because it straddles the celestial equator. So even the folks in the, in the south uh, can see uh, Orion, though Orion might look upside down. <laughs> uh, here's the head, uh, Maisa um, of Orion. This is the, one of the shoulders, Betelgeuse. This is a ruddy colored star, supergiant star, which uh, was uh, a star, literally uh, was 
was news item uh, in February, back in February, January, February, when it dimmed uh, strangely, and but it's now come back uh, to its normal brightness, uh, quote, quote unquote normal brightness, it's a variable star. Um, and then there's uh, Rigel, which is a bluish star uh, near the knee of Orion, and the the, uh, the belt stars. That that's what's most prominent for people looking and trying to find this constellation is this straight line of three stars: Alnitak, Alnilam, and Mintaka. And then, uh, so I'll I'll be talking about a star forming region right here. Uh, that's the Horsehead Nebula region, and then I'll be talking further about uh, the Orion Nebula, further down in the sword of Orion. So if you looked with um, different kinds of eyes, far infrared eyes, this same scene would look like this. And it's very different. In fact, it's so different as to be uh, bedazzling, uh, very difficult to comprehend. But this is the light from dust that has been worn by the stars. So the Maesa, I think it's a star system, a system of two uh, very hot, bright stars, which um, have basically um, uh, heated up uh, a region of gas and caused it to expand. And you end up getting a, um, a shell of dust in the outer parts, uh, which has been worn by those stars. So that's, the, that, that, that's one thing. The um, Horsehead Nebula region is here and the Orion Nebula is here. This is the plane of the Milky Way galaxy. Orion kind of hangs off of it a little bit uh, because it's rel relatively nearby. It, in fact, it's the nearest site of burgeoning star formation to us, especially the Orion Nebula region. Okay. Um, here is the view of the Horsehead Nebula region. And you see, basically you're seeing a cloud of uh, molecular gas and dust. Uh, and at these mid-infrared wavelengths, uh, you're actually detecting uh, the glowing dust and a particular kind of molecule known as a polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon, PA. Uh, but there is this protuberance sticking up some resistant region of gas and dust, uh, which is resisting uh, what's, uh, what's happening to this whole uh, surface here. It's being eroded by the photons, the ultraviolet photons coming from a star around here. It's called Sigma Orionis, and it's a very hot star, produces lots of ultraviolet radiation, which is uh, blasting into this molecular cloud and uh, ripping the molecules apart and then uh, ripping the uh, electrons off of the atoms. So uh, that's what it looks like in the mid-infrared. Uh, here's a, a, actually a better picture with the Spitzer Space Telescope um, centered, basically it, it's showing the light specifically from the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. So already we're seeing some fascinating chemistry in these uh, galactic ecosystems. In the visible, this is what most people uh, would recognize as the Horsehead Nebula. And uh, it highlights the, the, the cloud of gas and obscuring dust grains. Uh, and, um, but what is this pink light? Well, as I said, there's this star off to the right-hand side, uh, which is, which is um, hitting gas associated with the cloud uh, and causing uh, the molecular gas to go atomic and then to rip the electrons off and the, the hydrogen uh, produces this uh, fascinating glow uh, when the electrons recombine back onto the hydrogen nuclei, the protons. And so uh, it makes a, a great background to see this object in silhouette. In the near infrared, courtesy of the Hubble Space Telescope, you can actually see some of the stars uh, which are being born inside this uh, globule is what they call it. Um, and uh, this star obviously is, is doing something there. I think that that might be a jet, uh, though you'd have to, it could be a galaxy far, far, far away. Um, but uh, people have worked to see which stars are actually in the nebula and not background objects or foreground objects. 
Um, so this is a, an example of a star nursery. Going further down towards uh, the Orion Nebula area, uh, one finds recently, this is a uh, recent data, a uh, molecular cloud in the form of a filament. Uh, and this is being seen in the emission from ammonia gas. So what is that, NH3 or NH4? I always get that wrong. Um, and um, it, it shows just how filamentary the star forming molecular gas is. And overlaying on this, in this, in this image, is a, a bubble of star warm dust emitting in the uh, infrared, courtesy of the WISE Infrared Space Telescope. So pretty good, pretty good stuff. Uh, so remember this bubble because I'm going to show you another view of it. Uh, it's a view of the bubble from the uh, Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. This is the 747 jet that gets above 99% of the Earth's um, water vapor, and that enables them to, to see at these wavelengths. And uh, they're looking in the light, uh, far infrared light of ionized carbon. And uh, because carbon emits at a very specific wavelength, uh, they can track uh, the wavelength as, as observed, and uh, so uh, infer from the Doppler shift uh, the velocities and, and they've inferred that this is an expanding bubble and that it's probably being um, made to expand by strong winds from the stars being born in here. So everything is moving, everything is changing in these uh, cauldrons. At another wavelength in the near infrared, you can actually see the cluster of stars that's being born inside this molecular cloud, filamentary molecular cloud. And there's about a thousand stars and it's centrally concentrated. And uh, this one's an interesting region. This is a, a star that probably has a, a pre-planetary disk and the star is blowing a wind out both ends of the disk. Uh, the, the other, th I guess that's about all I wanna note here. So it's a robust cluster of stars and this is a very new object. It's only a few million years old, one or two million years old. The first hominids on this planet did not see this object in the sky, um, which was known as a smoking star to uh, the First Nations. Uh, the Hubble Space Telescope uh, going um, in, in the visible uh, allows you to see the gas which is being um, what was once a cold molecular gas uh, system, um, now has been turned into an, uh, a plasma of ionized uh, hydrogen, um, which is seen in the red here, um, ionized sulfur seen uh, with a little more yellow here, and uh, there's also ionized oxygen near the center. Uh, and so, uh, you're basically seeing a blister on the near surface of a molecular cloud erupting, or you could think of it almost like a volcano. But there's a huge cavitation in what was once a dense region of gas. Looking even closer, uh, you can see that the, um, there's a front, a shock front here. This is a photoionization front, which is basically a UV light coming and hitting this area hard with uh, ultraviolet photons. Here's a jet from an embedded newborn star. Um, and then of course, the center here, you're starting to see uh, the brightest stars in the cluster. And we'll home in on that. And here they are, they're known as the trapezium. Uh, they're easy targets for uh, amateur astronomers with uh, small telescopes. And uh, you can see there are strange things going on, especially around this star, Theta 1 Oriona C. And uh, you can see that there are what look like young stellar objects. I, they kind of look like these, those poor unfortunate souls in, uh, in um, The Little Mermaid. <laughs> and um, because you have these cometary uh, systems the stuff that's getting blasted. There's also shock waves in front of some of them. 
and I'm gonna go even closer and just look at these individual objects. And you can see in addition to the shock waves and the tails, some of them have what look like preplanetary disks, um, protoplanetary disks uh, seen edge on here. Uh, this one's seen edge on with a central protostar here. And then this one is seen face on with a central protostar. Pretty neat stuff. You can actually see planets in formation or at least the disks that will turn into planets uh, in a few millions to tens of millions of years. And uh, so here uh, is a simulation which gets pretty much gets you there. Let's see if I can, whoops, go back. I wanna be able to, there we go, I can hit it. Okay, good. So here is the simulation, I hope. And, oops. That face that is usually covered by her phone has finally made an appearance. That I have, to, I have to wait for this to go. Skip that. There we go. Okay, here we go. So you're seeing gravity at work here. Any over densities and under densities get amplified into tendrils of uh, unstable gas that can lead to stars. And then those stars and the um, disks surrounding them combine to produce jets, which have an effect on the whole system. And the net result is kind of a filamentary system of newborn stars. Set to lovely music. <laughs> I think we're almost done. So I'm going to stop it here get back to where we were. There we go. Okay, good, good. That worked out. Yay. Fairly chaos, a fair amount of chaos uh, leading to um, associated regions of uh, newborn stars. Uh, concentrating on just one of these protostellar cloud cores um, there might be a sequence such as uh, is shown here. You, you have the, the cloud core, and then uh, that leads to a protostar with a disk of um, material surrounding. And that disk serves as an accretor, uh, kind of a, a way for new material to stream into the protostar. Well, the protostar announces its displeasure by shooting off jets in opposite directions. Uh, and we, we can see all these uh, stages uh, at, at various wavelengths. And the, uh, the jets, the winds com combined to uh, sweep out the preplanetary disk so that what's left over is just a, uh, a mature planetary system, just planets, uh, much of the debris the gas and dust is blown out. And this probably takes millions to tens of millions of years uh, for the solar system. It probably took around 10 million years. So that's all, all without even thinking about what the mass of stars do. And I wanna draw your attention to uh, what one of these uh, violent regions uh, can do. This is the Eagle Nebula M16 at visible wavelengths, the, uh, this is the head of the eagle, I believe, and this is the wings of the eagle. And uh, it, the stars here, somewhat obscured by the head of the eagle, the hot stars have cavitated this whole region. 
what was once probably a dense molecular region has been cavitated by the, the starlight and the winds with the exception of these two, three pillars, this pillar, this pillar, and this pillar. And um, these are resistant uh, globules of uh, remnant molecular gas and dust, uh, which uh, are denser and so harder to photo erode. And um, you can take a closer look at these things. Uh, th these are the iconic images of the pillars of creation uh, so-called pillars of creation, kind of looks like a coral reef underneath the hot sun. Uh, and where the action is, is, is where the starlight is impinging on these, these surfaces and photo eroding uh, the material. And if you look uh, even more carefully and, uh, with a close-up, thanks to the Hubble Space Telescope, you can see that there are these evaporating gaseous globules or eggs. And what you're seeing is basically a race uh, between uh, these globules forming a uh, stellar and planetary system and or being eroded away. And it's not clear uh, who, who is winning. So a lot of dynamics. Uh, the, the other areas show a little bit of humor. Um, there is a, a, a intense star forming region in the constellation of Carina in the south. And a part of this uh, region includes this globule, uh, again, being photo eroded by a star somewhere over here. And um, I like to call that the flipping bird nebula. <laughs> but my poster child uh, for uh, this, these, these crucibles of creation has to be NGC 3603, also in the constellation of Carina. Not only does it have a centrally condensed a cluster of, of hot, bright stars, which are best seen in this image. There's probably a lot of lower mass, cooler stars as well. But uh, this one brings out the hot stars. There's even a star that's blowing its top. And then um, there are these pillars, once again, uh, pretty huge pillars of resistant material with all sorts of photo erosion and um, other kinds of ultraviolet processing taking place at these surfaces here. Some of the processing has chemical associations. So the UV can rip up molecules and put them back together in a process known as photolysis. So there's some interesting astrochemistry taking place here as well. And speaking of astrochemistry, I've been talking almost all uh, about uh, the formation of stars but the subsequent evolution and deaths of stars also adds to the uh, cosmochemical mix. And uh, examples of these are the, with these uh, so-called planetary nebulae, such as the Ant Nebula. And so you, you, you take a star like the sun, it's lived out its life, say, and then um, it, lose, it, it, it turns into a red giant. It stops fusing hydrogen in the core, starts fusing it in a shell, it becomes a red giant. Uh, and it expands and starts losing control of, of its outer atmosphere. The outer atmosphere ends up being cooler and cool enough for uh, some of the gases to crystallize. And so you can get um, uh, the first grains of interstellar dust manufactured in the outer atmospheres of these red giant stars. Uh, silicates like- uh, I'm sorry, dear, I'm under the headphones. Okay. Uh, Silicates such as uh, uh, what made that blue quartz that I showed, uh, and then graphites as well, and they're all ice coated, and um, then they get blown out in a later stage of the star's evolution, where it really loses control of its outer atmosphere, uh, becomes unstable, and starts uh, producing strong winds, uh, which in this case look very asymmetric, uh, and um, then those uh, that material gets illuminated by the hot remnant core of the star and they end up glowing um, glowing a, a, in a fluorescent process as a result of being uh, hit by those ultraviolet photons so we see these as beautiful objects um, and um, we're basically seeing astrochemistry in progress 
Uh, a good example of this is the ring nebula. Uh, this is a, 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 an attractive object for amateur astronomers. We can see this area, the, the ring, but in the infrared, courtesy of the Spitzer Space Telescope, they see this roseate, um, you know, like a carnation <clears throat> of dust that has been blown out in prior uh, episodes uh, as the star uh, was evolving uh, towards its death. And uh, the, 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 the dust is being warmed and it's made to glow and we can see it in the infrared. All this stuff gets blown out and will mingle, will intermix with wh whatever uh, molecular cloud material is in the galaxy. Uh, I, I can't resist showing this uh, rogues gallery, gallery of uh, planetary nebulae. These are some of the most beautiful objects in the sky um, and they're observed beautifully with the Hubble Space Telescope. They, they, many of them are asymmetric um, in different ways uh, with bipolar structures and then with rings, etc. cetera. Uh, how this all gets formed is uh, still a major area of research. Uh, they know that there must be some sort of uh, structure uh, down near the, the, the central star area, which is causing uh, certain directions to be favored in the outflow. Uh, one way is to have a planetary system around the evolved stellar remnant, and uh, that could be throttling the outflows. Uh, it could be a second star that uh, is um, causing the material to flow out in an asymmetric manner. Okay. Uh, up the masses, uh, and you end up getting more violent outflows. This is the luminous blue variable star Eta Carina with a yeah, nebula. My outflow. temptation is to slam the door, but you don't have to anymore. Just the light pool of it. Uh, sorry. And um, this, uh, this object was the second brightest star in the sky, I think in 1840. Uh, but um, what we see today are these two bubbles, bipolar bubbles, um, blowing outward. And uh, there's going to be all sorts of material that was cooked up in uh, the massive star that's now uh, flowing outward and will mix with the interstellar medium. And uh, this gets even more pronounced uh, with stars that literally blow up. Uh, Eta Carina has yet to blow up as a supernova. It could, uh, but uh, we do have evidence of stars blowing up. Uh, the, the Chinese and the uh, First Nations, the Anasazi Indians, recorded a uh, daytime star in the constellation of Taurus in the year uh, 1054 AD. And what we see today is basically this beautiful nebula. This is the guts of the star that have been blown out uh, by, the, by the explosion. And uh, we're seeing very hot gas, million degree gas in this uh, X-ray uh, uh, coated blue, uh, the visible, uh, which is tens of thousands of degrees is a coated green here and the infrared, which traces uh, warm dust, shock dust, uh, which is coated red here. And so uh, this is all stuff that was once inside the star and has now been blown out. And in that uh, demolition, uh, heavy elements such as the, the gold in my, um, my ring, which the gold in my ring and the silver in my ring may have been formed. There's another contender of uh, merging neutron stars might also produce uh, these sorts of things. Again, it's massive stars and their evolution, which is, uh, producing heavier elements to mix in with the interstellar broth. One of the most recent supernova remnants uh, is Cassiopeia A, and you can see it's a very busy affair with the, uh, the, the material coated blue in x-rays, so that's the million degree gas. Uh, the green stuff is um, coated uh, to represent uh, tens of thousands of degree gas and that's in the visible, and then the red is, is the dust um, uh, corresponding to uh, uh, what can be seen in the infrared. 
and uh, the, the neutron star here, I believe is this, I'm not sure, it could be that one, the remnant. All this is going out and will add to the mix. Uh, supernova remnants don't last long, around 50,000 years. They have lifetimes similar to that of uh, volcanic features here on Earth. Uh, they, 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 they dissipate into the interstellar medium. This is actually not the guts of the star, but actually material that has been piled up by the shock wave uh, from the supernova. And um, this is a very popular object for amateur astronomers to observe here in the Northern Hemisphere. So all this creative commotion uh, has been uh, going on for the 12 billion year history of our galaxy, uh, which allow, has allowed the galaxy to become a breeder of chemical complexity and, uh, and also a, a breeder of new worlds, including our own planet Earth. And uh, the places where it's happening most recently are these red objects uh, where the gas has been ionized by ultraviolet photons from the hottest stars. So the Milky Way is still actively breeding more chemical complexity and new worlds. Some examples here, just a few, are the stellar nurseries in Sagittarius, can be seen with binoculars uh, in the summertime, uh, the, including the Lagoon Nebula and the Triffid Nebula. Uh, again, that red glow is due to uh, the once molecular, cold molecular hydrogen having been ripped apart into atoms and the atoms, electrons having been ripped off and then recombined. Uh, focusing on the Triffid Nebula, you see a pink area and a blue area uh, that pink area is from the, the, the hydrogen, uh, which is fluorescing. Uh, the, the blue area is basically, uh, it's basically what you see with the blue sky. It's, a, it's, it's, it's gas, which is scattering gas and dust, mostly gas, uh, scattering light from the stars. Uh, but this image, which is not in the visible, shows something completely different. It's in the, in the mid-infrared and the color code tells me here that I'm looking at the, the molecules, the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. These are mats of benzene rings or benzene rings arranged in a mat. Uh, the interior here is, is the dust, uh, which is being uh, warmed by the starlight within. And here are the two versions of the same thing. There's the, the, these are the molecules and this is the dust. A better version uh, in, in its entirety is this color coded with the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons here and then the dust here. Pretty neat. So even at these large scales of you know, several tens of light years, there's fascinating molecular stuff going on. And uh, looking out, you know, zooming out, uh, you'll find that most of uh, this activity is happening in Spiral arms, this is an artist's depiction. Uh, and uh, we are in the Orion arm uh, or spur, sometimes they call it. Uh, some of these uh, nebulae are in the Sagittarius arm. So we're looking towards the center of the galaxy in this direction, much farther away. Uh, so that's another arm. And looking in the opposite direction, you would see objects like the Rosette and the Crab Nebula in the Perseus arm. So the spiral arms have something to do with it to get all this material uh, swept up and um, gravitationally unstable to collapsing and forming things. Going closer, uh, within 200 light years of the sun, you can see uh, just a mix of stars. And uh, there are some that uh, some of us might know such as uh, Aldebaran and Arcturus and Vega, but there are other stars which you might know, uh, might not recognize. And in general, there is no pattern in the stars because we're just basically in amongst uh, an ambient medium of stars uh, of varying birth dates. So you know, th that's not characteristic of the, of the spiral arm. And Looking even closer, 
yes, uh, we see that the sun and Alpha Centauri and Procyon and Sirius are relatively bright compared to the other stars in the, in the solar neighborhood within 10 light years. Uh, we basically are dominated by these little dim, dim red bulbs. Uh, that's what uh, dominate, and they, they might have formed a um, long, long time ago because they last so long. But the, the, more, the brighter stars like the sun and Alpha Centauri, um, they, they might be more recent objects. And in fact, uh, we have evidence to think that the sun and solar system was created 4.6 billion years ago. We have uh, meteorites that have uh, impacted Earth uh, and we can date them with radioisotopic um, methods. And we, uh, you hit a max of around 4.6 billion years. So they were probably from asteroids. And so that's the date of those asteroids. Uh, also, uh, what, what other evidence? Oh yeah, the moon. The moon has uh, rocks which have been brought back by our astronauts and we date them to a maximum of about 4.6 billion years ago. That's 7 billion years after the Milky Way was formed itself. It was formed 12 billion years ago. Uh, we're, we're pretty confident. And so what that means is that we have been the beneficiary of thousands of generations of massive stars that have come and gone and, and, and uh, contributed their largesse to uh, the overall chemistry of the galaxy. And in fact, uh, were we born early on in the history of the Milky Way galaxy, we might not have been able to have the rocky planets that we have today, uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, because that stuff hadn't been cooked up yet. But we do, we have a uh, rocky planet um, composed mostly of silicates, um, silicon and oxygen, um, and it's covered in water and it's been uh, moist. That surface has been moist pretty much uh, throughout the life of the earth, uh, which is, makes it unique among all the other planets. Uh, there's water on and in Mars, but it's uh, pretty much frozen. And who knows, there might have been water on Venus uh, back in the day. Uh, we beginning to suspect that there was a period where Venus did have water, but right. But basically Earth has had water throughout much of its life. And um, in addition to the water, there's land and uh, that land has been growing. Uh, the, it was, uh, there was more water than land, but nowadays um, there's more, there's uh, significant amounts of land um, and it has been transforming uh, its surface topography courtesy of the uh, plate tectonics uh, that move the, uh, the crust around. And so I, I get a kick out of this where Billy says, the ranger said the river dug the canyon, mommy, and you said God did it. Who's right? Well, this it begs a rather philosophical question, but I have to say that uh, the geologists have put together a pretty good um, mechanism by which these transformations can be understood. And that is the rock cycle. Uh, and I, we can start with the magma below the surface of rock, you know, hot molten or semi-molten rock, which uh, rises and cools to form igneous rocks, such as the granite on, uh, on Cape Ann. And if there's further uplift uh, due to uh, mountain building, you end up getting these things that stick up and get <laughs> worn down. Uh, there's weathering and erosion uh, and all those sediments settle down into uh, deposits, uh, which get buried and lithified, which means baked into rock. And you end up getting sedimentary rock, such as uh, sand into sandstone, mud into shale, um, and um, life, uh, calcareous life forms, uh, like seashells into limestone. Uh, that, that is a form of deposition. Uh, there's other ways to get uh, limestone as well, I have to admit. Um, but then if you get further heat and pressure due to um, uh, mountain buildings, say, uh, you will get uh, recrystallization to make another type of rock, 
uh, the sandstone turns into quartzite, the um, shale turns into slate, the limestone turns into marble. And all this uh, eventually can get subducted or buried back down uh, along a subduction zone due to the uh, motion of the plates, the continental plates, and this stuff ends up going back down into a magma state and the cycle continues. So this has been a rather successful model uh, and um, I'm, I'm impressed. <laughs> so here's the timeline that has been put together for uh, Earth's history. And you have uh, the formation of Earth 4.56 billion years ago. There was the, um, it differentiated, what that means is that uh, the heavies settled to the center and the lights floated to the top. So you have uh, iron and nickel uh, core in the center and you have silicates uh, in between and, and the lighter silicates uh, in the crust. So that happened pretty early on. Um, there was an impact around 4. Point, uh, I don't know, 4, 4.5 billion years ago where a Mars size object is thought to have hit the earth uh, to produce uh, the moon. And ever since then, the moon and the earth have been a, a duo, a dynamic duo. Um, the oldest uh, crystallization uh, seems to have occurred around 4.4 billion years ago. So the earth started uh, cooling back then, but there were still lots of impacts uh, because of the, uh, pre the protoplanetary disk was full of stuff uh, and there were a lot of impacts. And so it's not clear when the earth itself was able to um, really cool enough to harden up to have a, a crust that's thoroughly hardened. It might've been around 4 billion years ago where they had the oldest rock. The first evidence for life is isotopic 3.8 billion years ago. It's the ratios of various isotopes such as carbon, which suggests that uh, life was uh, kicking in. But the first fossil evidence is around 3.5 billion years ago. And you're just talking about simple microbes. Here is a, a picture of uh, the simple microbes in a colony, um, but uh, they do have definite evidence for it around 3.5 billion years ago. And uh, so that was microbes, 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 photosynthesizing, some of them were photosynthesizing. We have evidence for that with the stromatolites that can be found in the shallows of say uh, Austria, Australia. And then around 2 billion years ago, uh, there was enough photosynthesis to jack up the uh, content of oxygen in the atmosphere. That was bad news for most of these microbes, but good news for a small minority of them that could handle this injection of this, uh, so, uh, this gas rather than being a poison. It was, it was good for these microbes. And that led to the formation of uh, microbes with uh, nuclei in their cells. Uh, where all the uh, DNA and RNA could uh, reside. And th these are known as eukaryotes, and that's what's led to uh, the, the complex life forms that we know today, leading up to uh, around 600 million years ago, trilobites and other very fascinating life forms that we see in the fossil record. Uh, the dinosaurs come around 200 million years ago, and uh, and then of course we humans are only in the very recent uh, million or so million years, million or so years, the hominids. So that's the timeline. Uh, I like this uh, particular rendering of the timeline because it combines both uh, geology and life. Uh, you start with the uh, Cambrian explosion of life forms in the fossil record 550 million years ago. Um, and then uh, there's all this uh, motion of continents, which I'll show, uh, the, and uh, an ocean, which uh, was important to our own, my own Cape Ann, and various mountain building uh, events in uh, the North American continent. And the Permian, uh, where the extinction around 245 million years ago nearly wiped out all life on Earth. And that, that laid, uh, things open, or maybe opened up a niche for the dinosaurs to prevail. Uh, and they prevailed up until uh, the end of the Cretaceous, 65 million years ago, when a big asteroid uh, hit Earth and caused uh, basically the extinction of everything but 
shrew-like mammals. <laughs> um, and then today, uh, if you want to look at the Ice Age, which ended 12,000 years ago, uh, but it was, I guess it was, it was, it goes from 50,000 to 12,000 years ago. If you want to know uh, how long that ice age lasted and humans were around, uh, you basically, the, the, the age spans the amount of fingernail that you can remove with a single stroke of a file. <laughs> so um, basically all our time on earth as homo sapiens uh, is in that single stroke of a file. So here is a cartoon of what uh, we think happened to make uh, Cape Ann. Um, as I said, continents uh, were getting bigger, you know, the land masses were getting bigger over time uh, due to volcanism. And um, there was this uh, supercontinent known as Gondwana, but there were also these, also these microcontinents, which ended up drip drifting across what was then known as the Iapetus Ocean to dock with Laurentia, which is the, uh, the rootstock of the North American continent. And um, they did it in sequence uh, with the Merrimack, Neshoba, Avalon, and Maguma terrains. And we're the Avalon terrain. And um, so that can be seen all across the, the Northeastern seaboard but also in parts of Europe and the United Kingdom along some of the shorelines there. So it, I just find it neat to think that um, the granite that's in my house uh, was made 450 million years ago uh, as part of Africa, uh, which ended up cleaving off to dock with uh, the North American continent. So uh, we're getting near the end. Um, if you want to find out where the Avalon terrain exists, uh, this is where it is uh, in Massachusetts, followed by the Neshoba Merrimack terrains. And uh, west of this line, you go from uh, what was in Gond Gondwana into uh, basically volcanic uh, regions uh, associated with Laurentia itself. So it's neat to think that Massachusetts uh, embodies this history. All this time, 450 million years ago, life was well underway on Earth. As I said, uh, you're already past the uh, Cambrian explosion of life forms. And um, so the Earth has been a recipient of all kinds of chemical uh, generosity, uh, beginning in these star forming nebulae uh, where the massive stars can um, uh, reconfigure the molecules that are in the nebula. And um, that all can go into the formation of a uh, forming star and planetary system. And uh, that, that forms a, a new star with its planetary system. That star will evolve and outgas either uh, placidly or uh, violently, um, whatever it was able to make. Uh, and um, this stuff goes back into the interstellar medium and uh, gets caught up in new clouds of star forming gas. Uh, Earth uh, has been the beneficiary of comets. Uh, we think that the water is not of cometary origin, it's more internal um, and it was outgassed by the interior of the Earth. But the comets are an important deliverer of molecules, uh, organic molecules, including ethane, acetonitrile. Um, amino acids, uh, we know are in uh, interplanetary space uh, because we find them in the meteorites that have come to Earth. And uh, these are the basically the feedstock of proteins, which is a macromolecule. Other macromolecules that have been made here on Earth include RNA, DNA, uh, the carbohydrates, and the, the lipids. Uh, so Earth has been a, um, a very favorable place for further molecular complexity. But where did the life actually begin? Uh, was it down deep in the uh, volcanic vents, which have heat for energy and um, what is this? Uh, and sulfur-based chemistries, um, or uh, 
or, or is this not favored? It, it turns out that some people think that water, being surrounded by water is not good for the hookups that are necessary to build these larger molecules. But at least nowadays we can see that life is flourishing in these volcanic vents. Perhaps uh, the life arose in very hot pools of acetic uh, water, uh, such as uh, can be found in um, Yellowstone National Park. And these different colors represent different kinds of uh, heat loving microbes, uh, which prefer a very specific temperature. <laughs> these are known as uh, thermophilic organisms. So is this where it happened? Or did it happen in a more temperate uh, situation? Now, this is a quarry here on Cape Ann, so that's man-made, but the idea of a pond, um, a warm little pond like Darwin suggested, might be just the thing, especially if it can dry and wet, if it can go through cycles of drying and wetting, because that concentrates uh, the, the ingredients so that they, they're more likely to hook up. An example of this is this uh, scum, this uh, dark scum uh, on, on the shore, uh, on the granite. Uh, it's uh, made of fungus, uh, and, um, but it's very salty because of the uh, wetting and the drying. But even so, life was able to get a toehold uh, here, uh, well above the, uh, the high tide line in the splash zone. And of course, we now can see life um, such as these barnacles that are clinging to this granite and uh, they uh, are happily uh, living uh, with the, the tidal situation here on earth where the water comes and then the water goes. On land, uh, there's the lichen such as our, on, is on my house. And this is a symbiotic um, situation where you have photosynthesizing algae uh, in concert with uh, fungus, which is uh, getting the nutrients. And um, these are very uh, sturdy and hardy uh, life forms. I was, I've been disappointed that we haven't found anything like that on Mars, but maybe you need an atmosphere <laughs> with enough uh, oxygen. So uh, the story does continue here on Cape Ann, where you live and throughout the cosmos, um, we all have our to-do list and um, the cosmos certainly does as well. And so I want to thank you for your kind attention and may you enjoy uh, clear starlit lights going forward. Thank you. Okay, let's stop the share. And ask if you guys have any questions. Michael, are you going to have mute myself? Yeah. Okay. Roger that. Um, Nebulae. I have told people uh, out in the field uh, that a particular nebula was about as dense as vacuum. Um, and so I was wondering if planetary nebulae and star forming regions are equally uh, dense or not dense, or if one is more dense than the other. Uh, do we have that data? That's a good question. Uh, and it can be answered uh, because they have means of determining densities based on the spectral line emission from various atoms and ions. Uh, for example, uh, the, the light from once ionized sulfur produces uh, light, I just said light, uh, the light is at two different wavelengths and they can look at the balance of uh, intensities between those two wavelengths and they can get a handle on the densities. So I'm not going to give you an answer. I, I, I can just say that it's possible uh, that the, uh, they have those densities uh, determined. Yeah, they, okay. they have. It's, uh, they observe, let's say, molecular gas where um, st stars form. 
and they can work out the densities in certain, I mean, the gas is very hierarchical in that it has uh, structures within structures within structures, as you saw in Bill, the simulation that Bill showed. Mm. And you have densities on the outskirts of molecular clouds where stars form of like 100 to 1,000 uh, molecules per cubic centimeter. And then when you get into these cores, you can have much higher, like 10 to the fifth, 10 to the sixth, much, much higher. And uh, stars will form in, in cores that have these high, higher densities. And then the subsequent evolution, which you were talking about, Michael, where uh, maybe uh, the natal gas and dust has all gone away, but then the star starts outgassing all by itself um, and produces those nebulae known as the planetary nebulae. Those have uh, their own densities. And I can't give you the answer, but I, I think they're on the order of hundreds to thousands of particles per cubic centimeter. But I'm, I, I, I can't remember. That's, that's not a lot. No, it's, it's in the vacuum area. <laughs> so I wasn't lying, good. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll accept that as a response. <laughs> yeah, Bill? Yes, Paul. Yeah, I got a question that I, I've thought of. Um, and it's not a specific question. 100 years ago, they thought the Milky Way was the universe. And then Hubble and his buddies started realizing things were expanding. And then they get into radio astronomy. Do you think 100 years from now, people will have a different view of the universe and its nature, you know, its size and so on? That's a good question, too, because right now, all uh, there seems to be uh, a a consensus that the universe, our space time started around 14 billion years ago. Will that change? I don't know. Uh, it, would, it would suggest that the expansion history of the universe of galaxies is much different than what we think it is. We basically think that it's been fairly steady with a slight acceleration. And um, so as far as the age of the uh, universe is concerned, uh, I'm predicting that it's probably going to be uh, still 14 billion years ago. Am I happy about that? No, because uh, uh, I've always wanted a universe that was like about 20 uh, to 30 billion years so that there would be enough time for matter to get itself together to make the galaxies. Uh, but now the theorists have been able to uh, figure that out as well, that the overdensities uh, get denser and denser with enough time, in the amount of time uh, that we think uh, is left for, for that to occur. You know, it's only on the order of a few hundred million years now. So um, uh, I, I have a subjective feel. I would rather have a much older universe, but uh, every, everything seems to be pointing towards this 14 billion year old age. The other thing is that we can only see so far out. And the argument is, well, we don't know what's on the other side of how far we can see out. Right, there's a horizon to how far we can look. Yeah. Because uh, as you look farther and farther away, you're looking back in time mm -hmm. um, because uh, it, it takes a while for those photons to get to you. And uh, at some point, uh, we look, we're looking back to the point where um, the universe hasn't been made yet. <laughs> right. So there's a horizon. Uh, and, and so th this whole notion of multiverses, oh, yeah. uh, which suggests that there are many other space times co-evolving with one another. Um, all I can do is say that these notions exist and cosmologists are working on them. Well, the young age, it's, it's better that way. We're still under warranty. <laughs> Touche. All right, after having this wonderful water, which got made, God knows where. <laughs> yeah, uh, okay. yeah I, I wanted to mention something. Um, you were talking about how Helium formed after the Big Bang. Um, 
Yeah, you brought up an interesting point that I hadn't really thought about is that you need neutrons and you need the neutrons to not decay before they the helium forms. Mm -hmm. um, but the process, I think, is a little bit more complicated than, than you mentioned there. I'm, I'm not sure where, of, of course, but um, the neutrons break down, but in the process, the neutrons will create more protons that they do in our atoms, um, in the atoms of our bodies or whatever. Um, but also because there are a lot of high energy electrons, which would also help would combine with the protons to create neutrons. So, uh, right. So there, so be there a, might be a little ecosystem for a few minutes. Sure. Yeah, for, for a while before the, the density and the, and the temperature of the universe got too low for that to happen. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's it's a, a pretty successful, the hot Big Bang Theory. And it was all put together by these uh, guys uh, in the 50s, I think it was. Something like that. Yeah. yeah. Pretty impressive. They, you know, they, they had to act, it actually ended up constraining the time for uh, when everything had, for what is it? Cosmo, uh, nu cosmic nucleosynthesis, I think is what it's called. Primordial nucleosynthesis. Yeah. Yeah. Um, pretty impressive. I, so at that, you know, and, and it, for me, I'm basically a cos cosmological tourist. Well, they haven't shut the cosmos down for uh, COVID yet, so you know. <laughs> No, they didn't shut the cosmos down. Yes, and there have been other events which uh, reminded me of that. That when 9-11 um, occurred, I was on my way from Rockport to uh, Boston to teach at Tufts. And by the time I got there, you know, the, the buildings had collapsed and it was time to teach. And I asked the students, what do you want me to do? Do you want to talk about what has just happened or would you rather me talk about the universe and they said uh, well, why don't you just talk about the universe um i think in some ways it was re reassuring for them that the the cosmos yeah. was just going yeah. on and on it's probably easier to deal with the universe than than what was happening i guess yeah so it's one reason to get into astronomy there is a certain element of reassurance uh, that things go on. I see you, Laura. You gonna ask a question? I do have a question. Um, it could be very ignorant, so please forgive me, but you had an interesting slide that showed our sun in relationship to the other, other stars. And then there was a, a line that was indicating um, the, the, galac the direction of the galactic center. And mm. I wondered if you could say something uh, for a novice person like myself, about how we know about that, like which way to go, and like which this way is the go. way to the galactic center. Well, um, I have to admit that the amateurs had it right. All they had to do was look up, and you can see that yeah. there's something special happening in Sagittarius. That the uh, the band of the Milky Way gets thicker and brighter there, and um, it turns out that that's where the hub of the galaxy is. Um, we only see in about 5,000 light years. We don't actually see into the center, uh, which is about 27,000 light years distant. Uh, but uh, our view uh, is, is still good enough to um, match with what was determined uh, through great effort by uh, basically looking at radio wave emission uh, and noting that the, the velocities the Doppler velocities were going in one direction on one side of the center and going the other direction on the other side of the center. So yeah, the first detection of the galactic center itself was by Carl Jansky in the 1930s. He was a radio engineer working for Bell Labs and he wasn't, um, no, there was no radio astronomy back then. He was just trying to find sources of noise with this large antenna many meters in size. Mm. He was trying to find the noise from thunderstorms, but he found this strange source coming from the sky. And it didn't, uh, over the course of 24 hours, it wasn't, it wasn't exactly 24 hours. It was, uh, it was 23 hours, 56 minutes. It was the uh, sidereal rate. So he realized it was beyond the solar system and further uh, observations and in, in, um, afterwards, as Bill was talking about, confirmed that it was the center of our galaxy. 
And, and that is contrary to what was thought by uh, some leading astronomers uh, who thought that the sun was the center of uh, the, what was being called, I don't think it was called a galaxy yet. Um, and that was based on counting stars and estimating their distances. And th that led to an erroneous um, determination that um, we were in the center of it. There, it uh, everything was getting, it was denser towards us and then it thinned out away from us. But that ended up being an artifact of erroneous distance measurements due to the obscuration by dust. Oh. And I'm drawing a blank. There was a name for the un that universe, the something universe. I'm drawing a blank. But the, the so even the, even the best astronomers doing the most sophisticated work can completely get it wrong. Bite your tongue. No way. Uh, well, it's uh, this has been great. Uh, I know I'm going way over time for uh, 1623 Studios. Uh, so I'm probably going to have to pack it in. Uh, Christine, I'm glad you were able to make it throughout the whole thing. Oh, maybe not. <laughs> so any, any other uh, questions or comments before we call it quits? Thanks, Bill. It was great. Oh, okay. That's what I wanted. Thank you. I'm here. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everybody. It'll uh, get on the Galactic Inquirer and also on um, 1623 Studios, our local cable station. Take care. And um, YouTube as well, right? And the YouTube channel, yes. Yep. Thank you, Phil. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Great. Bill. Great. Thanks, Bill. Okay.